Today we're starting a brand new project. It's not gonna be immediately obvious what we're making, but let me know in the comments below if you guys can figure out what it is that we're starting to build. So this is the first part of this project, our first operation. It's a really big part. It's almost 60 inches long, and the table on our Minx is 60 inches long. So we're gonna have a few challenges here, especially on the two ends of the part, and we're gonna go through this step-by-step step for how we started to build this thing. So the very first thing that I'm gonna do is take the face mill and just make a quick straight line pass so that every subsequent pass is gonna start where there's no material. So that first operation was super simple. Basically all we did was face off the one side of the part. And now we're gonna flip the part over and start working on the opposite side. On this second side, we're gonna have the same issue where our part's just as long as our machine table. So I'm gonna do the same thing and just take a pass straight through the part. And this is gonna be for our face mill to plunge into to do the rest of the facing. In addition, on the other end of the part, I'm gonna cut this shoulder. And this shoulder is what I'm gonna use to set my zero for my third and fourth operations. I don't want to bore you guys with the mundane details, but all we're going to do here is we're going to cut two slots down the middle of the part, add some quarter 20 tapped holes, and then deburr everything and rough in our angle hole. All right, so now that we're done with our second side, it's time for us to flip our part again onto our third side. We have two big areas on the ends that are going to be completely cut off. We're gonna start by removing that material with our face mill as deep as we can. And that's the reason that I use this face mill instead of an end mill, because with this face mill, I can reach down about six inches. Whereas with an end mill, that would be an awful lot of stick out. All right, now that we have both ends of our part cut off, we're gonna come in and we're gonna face this top surface. Now, something that I wanna point out about this part is it's extremely cosmetic. This part's gonna be very visible and it needs to look really good. For our facing, we're gonna leave a finished pass for us to run later with coolant. Right now, we're just gonna run it dry so you guys can see what we're doing for camera. But we also have to be extremely careful with this part while we're moving it, while we're flipping it, while we're spinning things around. And we want this thing to look super perfect when we're done with it. Now that we have the profile of our part ready and we have that face prep, we're gonna come in and start machining these pockets. Now, if you look at the pockets, you can see that they all have tapered walls. It's like 10 degrees of taper. And I'm gonna be using a core five end mill to machine all these out. So being a five flute tool, I don't wanna just helix straight in there. Also, a lot of these core five end mills have a through coolant hole right in the center so they're not center cutting. So the first thing I'm gonna do is come in with a 421 drill and pre-drill a starter hole for each of these pockets. Now that we have those holes in our part, I can be a little bit more aggressive with our helix for our pocket start holes. Now for this 2D dynamic tool path, I'm only doing the pocket up until the start of the fillet. So essentially all we're machining is the flat floor of each pocket. All right, now that we have all our pockets started, we're gonna create a stock model, and we're gonna use that stock model for our next dynamic OptiRough toolpath. We're using the profile of our part as our containment boundary, and then we're just coming into each of these pockets and roughing out our tapered walls. Now on this first side of the part, you may notice that I'm skipping from pocket to pocket. And what I wanted to show here is that within the dynamic OptiRough toolpath, you have two options. You can either pick to rough by depth or by region. On this side of the part, I chose by depth. And that's why you'll see the tool skipping from pocket to pocket, just doing the same depth in each pocket. Then for each subsequent level, it's gonna do that in every pocket. All right, now that we have all of our tapered walls roughed out, we're gonna come in and just finish this floor here on this first level of this triangular pocket. And now we're gonna semi-finish all of our floors and tapered walls of our pockets with a half inch ball end mill. For the semi-finishing of these pockets, I chose to use a 3D high-speed equal scallop tool path. And this did exactly what I wanted it to. Started in the center of the floor and then worked its way out and then all the way up the walls. Now you may notice for the semi-finishing of these pockets, I'm using conventional milling. And the reason that I'm doing this is because I wanted to compare something. So on this side of the part, we're conventional milling for semi-finish and then climb milling for our actual finishing. On the opposite side of the part, I'm gonna use climb for both and we'll be able to see if there's really any difference in the finish between one side and the other. 
Now there's some big chamfers on the outside of our part and I'm going to use that same ball end mill to put those chamfers on. I could have thrown a nice big chamfer tool in there, but since I'm already surfacing for eternity on this part anyway, I figured what's an extra five minutes. Now we're gonna use our chamfer tool to just put the last little edge brakes on that we need and add our half 13 threads into the three holes inside this final pocket. All right, so we got our first side faced off. The finish looks super good. I don't know if you guys can see it in the video, but we had some really nice rainbow reflections coming off of this face, and that's exactly what we were looking for. Now all we gotta do is flip our part over to the opposite side, and we're gonna do the exact same thing over again. We're gonna take our face mill across the top surface, cut all of our pockets, add our threaded holes, and then add our chamfers and fillets. After that, it's off to the CP6000. Now the reason I need to take it over to the CP is because this part's almost 60 inches long, and the holes that I have to add need to be perpendicular to the angled faces. And now I'm going to have to flip the part 180 degrees and shift the part in our vise so that I have enough travel to reach the other eight holes in that middle slot. And then we come in with our thread mill at our half 13 threads. And then we start dynamically roughing out our slot in the center of the part. And you can see this is pretty sketchy. I have one end of the part in two vices and all the rest of the part is hanging out in space. Now that we have our slot cleared out, the only thing left to do is for us to come in and finish off this tapered hole. All right, so take a look at our part. All of our faces look super nice. We got a nice rainbow finish coming off of all of our flat surfaces. All of our pockets look really good. I really don't notice any difference between the pockets on the first side and the second side. So like I said, I ran conventional and then climb on one set of the pockets and then climb and climb on the other set of pockets. And they pretty much look identical. So the first part of this project is now complete. I'm super excited to show you guys the next parts to this assembly because we're gonna be doing them on all new machines machines. So stay tuned because our shop is going to look a lot different. Please like and subscribe and I'll catch you guys again soon.